So, before we move to the next session, we wanted to give our special thanks to our silver partners, Lamassu Industries, Institute of Economic Affairs, the Fund for American Studies, Young Voices, Anglo-American University, Liberation Travel, and Free the People. So give it up for our sponsors. For our next session, uh, I'm really interested in this particular session, but it's also been a piece of anxiety for me because of the introductions that I have to do. So for mispronouncing any of the names, uh, you'll have to excuse me in advance. I'll do my absolute best. So, um, we are hosting Natalia Melnik, Tatiana Chomic, Dr. Dmitry Dubrovsky, um, about Eastern Europe and Russia. Tatiana's activism started in May 2020 when she joined the team of Viktor Babarika, presidential contender in the Belarusian presidential, presidential election, I'm tripping up on the English words, uh, presidential election 2020, as a media manager. Tatiana is the sister of Maria Kalesnikova, a Belarusian political prisoner, um, and uh, after Maria was detained in September 2020, Tatiana became a voice for her sister, as well as for all political prisoners in Belarus. Dr. Dmitry Dubrovsky has been an associate professor of international relations, political science, and human rights at St. Petersburg State University, and has also been affiliated with the Andrew Gagarin Center for Human Rights. He focuses on xenophobia, homophobia, and far-right nationalism. Uh, Natalia Melnik is a communications director at at Bendukidze Free Market Center, sorry. <laughs> she is a postgraduate re researcher at the Kuras Institute of Political and Ethnic Studies. Natalia conducted research on national sovereignty and on the political identification of the Ukrainian society. This session will be moderated by Victoria Vdovyshenko. Good track. <laughs> Tripped it up just a little bit. Uh, Victoria has a PhD in foreign policy and world history from the Diplomatic Academy of Ukraine. She's an associate professor and researcher working on the challenges of the European Union, Euro-Atlantic integration, and hybrid warfare. She's also a board member um, at the Professional Government Association, a network of Western educated professionals helping the government of Ukraine to do reforms. So thank you so much. Thank you for bearing with me, and thank you for our speakers. Thank you. Uh, thanks, of, thanks, first of all, to everyone who are here. Um, we are very much privileged to be with you today. And actually, what I call this panel on the ground, because like what you heard from the previous panel was a theoretical concepts. Let's come to reality. That's what my idea is as a moderator. So the idea is like, we're gonna have for each of the speaker some couple of questions from me, like for 25 minutes, and I'll make sure that you have 20 minutes of a real talk with you. So please prefer uh, for a real q and I'll be uh, picking up already the hands, because here you have the possibility to hear from uh, Ukraine, from Russia, and from Belarus. Not somewhere, but here at this stage. I'll draw my attention to uh, Dmitry. Um, you know, like many of uh, us uh, know and we heard already that Russians who live in Russia and Europe support so much of the politics of Putin. And we already have seen these statistics that came through that about 80% of uh, there is a support. So can you elaborate on that more to, to make sure what is the reality? And in this point, you're here with us. Right, so uh, you, why you and your colleagues are not protesting Putin regime? Are the liberal values gone there? Thank you very much uh, for invitation. And in my case, it's not formality. Indeed, as a citizen of the country who is currently involved in the crimes against humanity in Ukraine, I feel myself ruined and you know devastating and disoriented for the last. Three weeks after the well, month already when the war was started. And that is what I'm trying to do, what we are trying to do. We're trying to do all our best, the rest of us who are still in Russia, who left the country. I was, I was, you know, I was I should leave the country because I was <laughs> kind of awarded by the Russian government uh, two weeks ago as a, they putting me into the list of the foreign agent. 
for no reason I am foreign agent media. Whatever it means, I simply don't know that. Don't ask me. But still, I am foreign agent media. You can see. And uh, the problem with the sociology in Russia, especially in authoritarian context in general. Well, first of all, there is no sociology. It's the poll. Good. So this is just a tool. So this is sociology. sociology so tell us the secret. Sociology is starting when we started to interpret the data. And uh, as a well person who are recently involved in the mostly sociological uh, research, I, I should say this is, the, this is the number which means nothing, literally. Because if, uh, if you can go, like, like my colleagues and, and friend Vladimir Karamurzak, who recently, yesterday, was arrested just for publicly called the, the war, the war, and he is facing the 15 years in prison, and you approach to the, to the people of the street and ask them what their attitudes to the, to the special military operation, what are you supposed to have as a response? Either agree or fully agree, of course. And that is the, my interpretation of these results is very simple. We have 20%, 20 percentage of people who courage to respond uh, in, in, in uh, something different, some different way, at least uh, either disagree or fully disagree. And this is the one point. And second point, uh, do not forget, please, that even the sociology started to be the tool in the authoritarian regime. What we can have right now, if you can take a look on the FCOM, let's say, uh, this is the very effective tool, not only sociological survey, but the state propaganda. And that is why how the sociology also, I mean the sociologists who serve for this center, I believe, they should be considered as a part of the state propaganda in Russia. So this I'll stop here. Dmitry, but you know, I would like more elaborate on my second part of the question, which I really want to um, paraphrase again. So uh, if that's what we see, why don't you advocate abroad that the regime change is needed? And if yes, how you do that? There are many Russians already abroad, like those who are believed to be liberal. So what's the situation with that? So I would say we have here the, the representatives of free countries. And for now, in the future, in hope, I can see the Belarus. We still don't have a country, but they still have, they do have hope. What about Russian liberals? We, we currently don't have either country or hope. That is the, this is reality. Maybe for tomorrow we will elaborate, we will find a way to get out or to, to do something with the, our responsibility, with our shame, with our devastation, with our anxiety, what we, we currently have. But for now, I cannot have the kind of recipe to, to get out. Oh, thank you, Dmitry. I'll uh, turn my attention to Tatiana. And um, in this respect, you know, like uh, you yourself uh, know a lot what freedom is also because uh, uh, you see how much of the human rights violations are happening in Belarus. Uh, so you're already here to present that. And uh, freedom means the supremacy of human rights everywhere. We know that. Uh, can you elaborate more on, uh, on what is the situation on the ground? There are many of the prosecutions and the repressions going on. But also, you know, if possible, we know that uh, the rules uh, for talks comes when the media is on the ground. So what is the situation with the free media? If we can think about that and the message of it. Thank you. So actually the repressions that started in Belarus in August 2020 are still in progress. People are arrested every day, literally. They are arrested because of participation in protest in August 2020. They um, just search uh, by photos on the media that they shared before and they are arrested. Uh, now the term of uh, detention actually and sentence uh, grew and if previously they were arrested for one or two years it can be now three, three, five, seven years in prison just for going out, just to go into demonstration. So as for now we have um, 1,143 political prisoners. It's official data but unfortunately we know that uh, this amount is more. Some of people just afraid to be to refer to human rights defenders to speak about their relatives who are in prisons. So it's probably up to 2,000 people who are persecuted on uh, political grounds. About the media itself, so in summer 2020, all our media, all our NGO organizations faced with um, like new wave of repressions, and 
almost all of them were closed. People were detained. Some journalists uh, had possibility to escape. But uh, there is, so, and they work from abroad, actually, how it happens. People are still uh, can share these uh, updates for uh, media, for journalists. There are some journalists, but it's a kind of a partisan work on the ground. And um, yeah, it's difficult, but still we have uh, independent media who are working from abroad. And uh, hopefully it, they will work, uh, they will proceed their work in future. And we have um, also uh, regarding, <laughs> because it's very important, because a lot of media channels were recognized as uh, extremist organizations. It means that people who follow them uh, on the Telegram channels, on the Facebook, anywhere, who put likes on the posts or share the posts with, uh, from such media, they can be persecuted and also they faced with uh, like three years of sentence and so on. Tatiana, but still like uh, Belarusians are courageous people and because uh, many of them actually uh, said no to Lukashenko's uh, uh, you know, decision to join um, as missile attacks uh, on Ukraine, even if the missile attacks are still happening. We know that. Can you elaborate more what are the, let's say, uh, for a moment, the movements or like the voices of the Belarusians to be heard more about what is their position towards uh, the situation in my country, in, in Ukraine in particular? So, uh, Belarusian people actually started to express their attitude to the war and to participation of uh, Belarus from the very first days. We had a um, referendum on constitution on 27th of February and that day people went to protest against the war. And uh, more than um, 1,500 people were arrested because of them, that uh, they were sentenced to like 15 day days. They were beaten uh, hardly, tortured also, but still they are expressed, yes, their attitude to it. Uh, also, uh, we already have uh, independent polls result and fortunately only 3% of people support and think that Belarus also should participate and Belarusian troops should, should be brought to Ukraine. About 25% support Russia, but, uh, support Russia in this uh, war, and we consider it uh, as um, influence of uh, Russian propaganda because we had a very strong influence on media from uh, Russia, and this the sound of uh, Russian propaganda appeared in May, in August 2020, and they um, they actually pushed the same. Um, the same position as in Russian state media, they push it in Belarusian media, in st Belarusian state media. So, and also, uh, of course, we have uh, about 25% of people who are state neutral, that uh, neither uh, supporting neither Belarus, neither Ukraine against war, actually. And uh, about 50% uh, support Ukraine in this, uh, in this war. And of course, there are some of the people who are still uh, afraid to express them, even in anonymous posts, it's about 30%. Thank you. I'd like to draw to Natalia, you know, like for what we heard here, and it resonates so much to many, many of the Ukrainians, Ukraine is like kind of a lab of democratic innovations. We are actually here to teach you what this means, the fight for the democracy, really, and for the liberty and for democratic principles and freedom. Um, you know, like taking into account the situation now and just Odessa was bombed 20 minutes ago with some missiles and we know tomorrow is our Easter. Um, what takes you personally so strong and committed to what you're doing and in particular in your um, in your city where you're staying and still what are your examples that you can share can be useful to understand Ukraine to this audience more and more where are the young people who are still diving into understanding what's Ukraine um, well you know I never thought that I would live to see the day in which when you say like hello I'm from Ukraine and I still live in Ukraine it would be um, taken as an accomplishment of sorts. Uh, because to me, it's not an accomplishment. It's not something special. It is uh, my duty as a person who um, 
wants to see a better Ukraine. Um, when, you know, when this latest invasion, right, because the war started eight years ago. So let's not talk about months or, you know, weeks or things like that. This has been going on for a while. It was just convenient for a lot of people not to view it as a war. But the latest invasion, when it started, and uh, like all of us Ukrainians who had some kind of social media presence and knew English a little bit, we decided we need to talk about what's happening in our country. And uh, for the first two weeks, uh, I was bombarded. Uh, there was a lot of banning activity going on on my Facebook page, but I was bombarded by messages from people all over the world saying, you know, this is all Zelensky fault and you should just stop fighting because you know your people are dying. Really? I kind of know that, you know, every day we track how many people were killed. Natalia, which is true because I remember the first week no one even in your countries believed that we're gonna resist. Like, uh, put yourself or zoom yourself back to uh, the mid of uh, February and the end of February. Even your governments were advising some of uh, Ukrainian government representatives to do that, you know. Yeah, well, Germany, yeah. right? In particular. <laughs> in particular. Right, so the expectation was for us to fail and it seemed like for a long time we needed to prove that we are here to stay, we're taking a stand, whether it is with guns, you know, before we have conscription, you know, um, freedom loving people are against conscription for obvious reasons. And uh, um, they were also naming corruption, you know, like why take sides in what's going on? Um, these are both corrupt countries and things like that. Um, well, before the war with Russia, um, People bribed their way out of, you know, getting called up for army duty. Uh, after the latest invasion, people started trying to bribe their way in. And it says a lot about the attitude we have in the country. So for us, this is a fight for literally our freedom. This is the self-defense, right, we're all talking about. This is about property rights. We are defending what's ours. We were not going to attack anyone. We are a peaceful nation who has never in our history attacked anyone. And, uh, um, you know, having to fight this wave of misinformation about what's going on in the country. For us, it's very simple. We're Ukrainians, we're from Ukraine, this is Ukraine, this is our home, we're fighting for our freedom. Because if we lose this, it's not going to happen, but, you know, if we imagine. Uh, loses, losing this thing, it means the end of Ukraine. The end of Ukraine the way we want to see it. You know, it's the end of an independent country, um, because then it will be turned into some sort of uh, Russian satellite, right? With no rights, no freedom, and uh, um, there's no point in staying in Ukraine like that. That's why we are staying in Ukraine right now, for that not to happen. Um, before I come to you, I would really would like to uh, pose a very short, not short question, but mostly, you know, like the question to digest. It comes to me from the previous panel, like, what's next? That's normally the question that all of us are thinking together. Uh, Dmitry, I know it will be difficult for you to answer this question, it's I, for obvious reasons, but still, you know, um, how long Russian nation is ready to tolerate the situation like that? What's your personal prediction? Because here we are talking about our personal experience. My prediction never worked. Last time I made a prediction that Trump won. Uh, and this time? This, the, the, what my fear is, personal, is that Russia is prepared for this situation. And I'm, I'm afraid I'm, I sl slightly disagree with the previous panelists when they evaluated their, their readiness of the, the Russian elite to fight. Because that is the under-evaluation which had happened even before 2014, 2014, I believe. The substantial amount of the scholars believe that is the just highly corrupted authoritarian regime. And the highly corrupted authoritarian regime is very 
easy to deal with, right? So this just bribe them or just give them additional privileges or just, you know, like, like in some European countries do, they uh, very actively involve these money. For example, for the development universities, well, I still remember this is fantastic story with the Blavatnik School of Good Governance. It's the Putin Kroni who established the, the, in the Oxford University who established the Blavatnik School of Good Governance and to brought, by the way, Yekunin to explain the a little bit shocking students what is the good governance from the Russian perspective. <laughs> and this is, uh, I believe, uh, uh, something we, uh, we, we should avoid. And, and, and it's happened, this regime, seriously and deeply ideological. And we should reassess and reevaluate the readiness of these people to fight. And as, as from my understanding right now, their people had been prepared for these wars even before they annexed Crimea. And it's now, is not ad hoc planning. This is the planning of the, for the old, old long war, I'm afraid. So my, my prophecy is not very good, actually. I'm afraid this was the long war, and this all Europe should prepare for. Uh, it's the first time I'm agreeing with Russia, you know, in these circumstances, because we, we, we believe the Ukrainians is going to be a long-lasting thing. Um, Tatiana, may I refer to you, you know, um, a bit different, but still for the futuristic uh, question, if possible. How do you see and when Belarus maybe without Lukashenko? And what kind of diplomacy, if any, uh, should Europe use while talking with Lukashenko to whom it listens to? So after the war started, uh, actually, uh, I had, we had, Belarusians had a lot of um, thoughts. It's kind of a simplification that, okay, when Ukraine will win, uh, it will be easier for you also for Belarus, but unfortunately, I don't quite understand why people think like that. For us, um, as far as we see now, for us, some new op opportunities here they appeared, but chance of these opportunities are two ways not enough, very, very small, but uh, actually other um, variant is more probable and it's not very good, yes. So the two, two options um, became even, even more closer to Russia and more dependent to Russia. As soon as more sanctions will be uh, raised against Belarus, together with Russia, the same sanctions. So it will make uh, Belarus more independent and uh, more isolated from uh, Western world. So it's not... Uh, the best option, of course. And it means that uh, Belarus will slowly die, yes, for next 5, 10, 15 years, together with Russia, two, two dictatorship countries will be so much isolated. And the other option, uh, which is not so maybe probable, yes, that uh, Belarusian authorities already started to put some signs that they are ready for a dialogue with Western countries, with the European Union. It was already announced, published and shared. But of course, uh, the answer from uh, Ambassador of United Sta States actually also was published that, okay, uh, so to make something, some dialogue start, you should actually do a lot of jo job inside Belarus. First of all, release political prisoners. All the thousands or two thousand that are there. Stop repressions, yes, because it's also one of the uh, most important things, just uh, so the country uh, not stay so in such a stress. And also start a dialogue with uh, your people inside Belarus. So, until now, actually, Belarusian authorities make these contradictionary steps. Yes, from one side, uh, provide some, share some signs that they're ready for negotiations, but from the other side, repressions continue. Thank you. Uh, I'll refer to Natalia. You know, I'll definitely want to elaborate more on the sanctions, but also to another thing, you know, like 
thinking Ukrainian, we are thinking about the future even now. I mean, we already thinking about how to rebuild our country. Uh, we are already having many, many expert, professional, young leaders groups who are making the network like mine, for example. We took together, we uh, look to the international expertise and we are thinking about like say, the future. One of the future is the EU one. And now, uh, as you know, like two, uh, three days actually ago, um, Charles Michel uh, was in Kiev and uh, the President Zelensky introduced him this uh, questionnaire that was given in order to be prepared for the next summit of the EU, what makes it in June. And I heard from some of my European colleagues that they are afraid oh, gosh, Ukraine might come to the EU. So what will be your response to those who are still do not believe, you know, that it's something happening realistically? Well, you know, um, this is the perfect window of, of opportunity for something like that to happen. Because we all understand this is a political decision. This is not a matter of, you know, Ukraine being in line with certain demands. Um, Ukraine is really far from a perfect country. We have a lot of issues that we've been trying to deal with over the past uh, almost a decade now, uh, including corruption, including the lack of rule of law, which is a significant problem. Um, we've been making progress, but uh, you have to understand that for the system, to reform itself, it's basically impossible, right? So there has been a lot of struggling uh, with that, um, but um, none of that um, is an explanation and none of that excuses what's going on in my country right now, right? Um, like Dimitri said, I have a home and I have a country, right? But it, it doesn't just appear out of thin air. This is something you have to fight for. Ukrainians are well known, at least in Europe, because almost every 10 years we have a major revolution going on. <laughs> we take to the streets, we voice you know, our disagreements, and it's not just because we are horrible people and we hate our government. No, because we are not afraid of talking about the things we believe in. If you keep being afraid, you're not going to have a country. No one will give you the country. So for us, European Union, it used to be an answer to a lot of problems, right? Back in 2004, because we thought, we're gonna join the EU one day, the corruption will go away, all of our issues will magically disappear and we're going to live like rich Germans, right? That was the dream, of course, uh, right? That's why we, are, we were so outraged in 2013 when our government said, you know, guys, sorry, but we are moving closer to Russia, right? We're our future is with Russia. And you all know what happened, right? Um, after the revolution, um, you know, this huge wave of mm, misinformation started coming out. We kind of ignored it, right? Because we thought it was stupid to um, argue with people who thought that we had a military coup without the involvement of the military, right? That installed the Nazi rule in Kiev and this Nazi government kept bombing its own people in the East doing it non-stop for eight years with no real damage and without you know, anything d being done about it. And it was our mistake, right? Because it appears that a lot of people believe that. So I have a little, uh, I guess, coming out. I'm from Ukraine, but I'm not a Nazi. Our government is not Curious, a yeah? Nazi, right? Our, uh, actually, our president is a Jew. So it would be kind of you know, confusing uh, for a lot of people. So. Um, Right now, the EU is not the answer anymore, right? Because we understand that these are the things that we need to deal on our own. The same I can say to the, the Belarusian and Russian counterparts. Um, it might sound horrible, but these are your problems to deal with. We dealt with our authoritarian wannabe in 2013. 
We were scared. There were tanks outside of Kyiv. We never knew where the army would go, you know, how they would react. We are still scared now because we're getting bombed every day. In the past 24 hours, Kharkiv got bombed 50 times. A lot of it coming from Belarus, right? So I feel that if Belarus wants to start a real dialogue, um, you know, uh, seizing, allowing, you know, a different country to bomb your neighbor would be a good start, right? Before you start the dialogue with your own people, that would be helpful. Uh, but for us, the EU um, taking these steps, it just means that they acknowledge that we are worthy of being part of European family. Because Which is true. Ukraine Absolutely. is a European country, right? We shouldn't be looking for extra validation. But uh, it would be a reaction to the horrible tragedy we've been going through, you know? Of course, we would be more interested in uh, joining NATO, to tell you the truth, because uh, for us, it is a security guarantee, right? Um, you know, with Russia trying to demilitarize us, it's turning us into one of the strongest and uh, best equipped armies in the world. Um, but the problem is, Russia will keep coming back. You know, if we do not ha like get uh, to a point of a really decisive victory, mm -hmm. it will go back, it will create its Russian ghetto within its borders in isolation. They will keep getting angrier. They, were, you know, they will raise a bigger army, they will come back until they get their asses kicked again. So uh, our plan is, our future for Ukraine, is to make the country prosperous and strong enough that the price of attacking it is completely out of the question, right? And this is what we're trying to do. We're trying to make them see that if they come to our land, they're gonna you know, end up in it you know, or go back in coffins, because they, they tend not to pick up their corpses, so I guess we will have to be, I don't know, delivering them back. But that's the thing, you know, we are a nation of volunteers. We are fighting not because the government is telling us to fight, not because the EU or the US are telling us to fight. We are doing it because we actually believe in it. Some people don't believe, you know, uh, that this is real, but this is what valuing freedom is. You know, if the EU takes us in, sure, that's great, but it does not, um, you know, on this, upon this fact, um, our future does not depend, right? Absolutely. It depends on Natalia. if we make Russia go, you know, away and leave us alone. Uh, I just wanted, you know, like, this is the point that we were, thank you, because we want to keep uh, some questions into, and now you know some of the secrets in the DNA of Ukrainians, uh, like Belarusians and Russians, so questions. We have some time for questions, and I'm kind of maybe picking them some of several, if possible. And uh, I know there are some people with mics. We are here. We have here, then here, and here. Like we have two. Then yeah? okay. Please Hello. present yourself. Uh, we concentrated a lot on the war now, but I am thinking also longer term. And if I look at Eastern Europe and Russia, both parts are not having enough children. No, the, the population is declining rapidly per generation. If, if every couple just has one kid instead of like in the past two or three, then uh, the whole of where is liberty going to be when there is no population left? <laughs> okay, so question and then another one just to pick them together. Can you present yourself? I'm B. Jedlička, I'm the founder of Liberland, and I would like to ask you just a hypothetical question. And I'm always struggling between these self-governance and the right for self-determination and the territorial integrity. And I would like to learn your opinion about it. Let's just hypothetically say that that uh, Crimea basically organized itself a referendum on the idea, and, and it's a hypothetic situation, and that that referendum was actually sound. And, and let's say 80% of people in Crimea, theoretically, they, they voted hypothetic situation for the independence of Crimea and maybe for joining Russia. What do you think would be the proper reaction of international community, Russia, and what should be the proper reaction 
of Ukraine in that oh. hypothetical situation. Okay, really. so we have two interesting questions, and I think it's to all of the speakers, right, if I got correctly. Uh, so the question of aging population and lack of people, I think it refers to each and every one, right? So just if possible. Probably I can start. Sure. It's a really good question, and I think that this is something that... Uh, Belarusian authorities didn't think about, definitely, because in uh, 9 million population Belarus, uh, during this year and a half, uh, several thousand, hundred thousand people actually left Belarus because of persecution to Lithuania, Poland and also to Ukraine. So um, I think the, the best way, yes, in several years, it would be make all these people, actually this is the most, how to say, creative people, people with a uh, good level of life, yes, to, for outcome for Belarus to make the, these people come back. Yes, this is uh, what, what I talked before, uh, like start uh, this process of some kind of democratization of the country so that these people can return and proceed uh, to live there. Uh, Dmitro and Natalia. Uh, uh, in fact, so I, because I am always dealing with the, you know, nationalist outcry. All Russian people are dying because it's not enough uh, birth rate. Uh, let me tell you, so that is my hope to convert Russia to more diverse people, more diverse uh, ethnically, culturally, and religiously. And this is the migration would do. So if there, there were, let's say, it, at least for Russia, if the Russia would would invite more uh, people from Central Asia. From the other countries, that is that would be the best solution for the birth rate. Believe me. Mm -hmm. Natalia, uh, hypothetical question of Crimea. Right? Yeah, well, before that, interesting fact about birth rate: um, over thirty thousand Ukrainian babies were born in bomb shelters since you know the, the latest escalation started. Um, our biggest fear is actually not the, mm, let's say the low birth rate, but the brain drain before even all of these events, because this was, you know, these are the people who could prove to be very useful for the new Ukraine, right, for the prosperous, uh, for the successful country. And uh, um, the way we are looking at it right now, after we win, um, there will be a lot of rebuilding to do, right? So. Up to 30% of Ukrainian is infrastructure is completely destroyed right now. Uh, whole towns, cities, you know, to the east, north, and south, completely destroyed. So um, it um, basically puts us in the position in which we not only, like, I disagree with the notion of rebuilding Ukraine. Uh, my point of view is that we need to build a new, much better country and uh, we need to seize this opportunity and if we um, commit to this goal we will see a lot of ukrainians coming back not only the you know the refugees they don't want to be called refugees they are very temporarily displaced people <laughs> because most of them are planning to come back and giving them you know a reason to come back to because we won't be able to give them a home unfortunately because a lot of them lost their homes but giving them a reason, a, a nice goal, and uh, proving that it will actually happen. You know, it's not just the word, words. And um, as for Crimea, um, Crimea is a very interesting case because when we're talking about Crimea, we need to know the history of the peninsula. We need to understand that there are natives there who are Crimean Tatars. So this is their home, first of all. Then there are Russians who were moved there uh, to make it more Russian, you know, during the mm, Soviet times and um, Crimean Tatars were deported. The situation with the human rights is terrible in the country, so uh, activists, their families are disappearing every day. Um, some of them reappear somewhere in Russia, in camps or prisons, some never appear again. And these are the people who ignored the referendum in the first place because they thought that going to vote when you have armed soldiers standing behind you would not be very valid, right? Um, so they didn't see a point in it and that's how the referendum started. If it were a real referendum, um, Crimea was an, an autonomous region throughout the history of Ukraine. And uh, um, if 
the referendum was sound, and even, like, it doesn't have to be hypothetical, right? If Russia withdraws its army and its fleet, because that's where it's based, uh, because of our stupidity, we um, allowed them to rent, <laughs> you know, the area. So if they withdraw completely, and, uh, uh, you know, in an, n when we are in a position in which we know that the referendum can be a free and genuine expression of free will, then the situation will be completely different. You know, if the people, the locals, get to speak, then we are open to having a conversation with them. But Russia needs to withdraw itself from this conversation. It's a Ukraine issue. Uh, thank you so much, Natalia, and to all of them. And I'll um, pick three questions because I promised one, two, and then some, someone was raising hands there. So please present yourself. Yeah. Uh -huh. That gentleman was first, but that's fine. You will pick together. We'll okay. pick together. Uh, Marek Tatawa, Economic Freedom uh, Foundation from Poland. I have a question. When we return home from this conference, what we can do more or in terms of lobbying for our policymakers, governments to change, to help Ukraine and to change uh, regimes in Belarus and Russia? Thank you, Marek. And question I promised here. Uh, actually, my question is a bit broad, so maybe you would answer to that and then I would ask. Or maybe uh, we will I? not have time. So if you okay, thank yeah. you. So um, I'm Dachi uh, from Georgia, Tbilisi. So I think that uh, when talking about Eastern Europe and Russia, and this panel uh, has been uh, about the topic, uh, it would be nice if we mentioned <laughs> Georgia, because uh, that's where it all started actually. Uh, in actually, uh, people think that uh, Georgian war um, happened in August. Uh, 2008, and this was the first time Russia uh, expressed its aggression towards their neighbors, but no, uh, after the fall of the Soviet Empire in, uh, in the 90s, it was uh, the war in Abkhazia, the western region in Georgia. And Transnistria. And Transnistria also, which so by the way question? Russia uh, said that they would uh, like to like get their army into there too. Um, so the thing is that uh, uh, some people don't even know because there was no social media or there was no internet back then, but uh, the things we see in Ukraine today, like in Bucha or in Irpin or other cities, there were children are raped and uh, killed, like pets are killed. The same things happened in uh, Georgia. I will say not a very pleasant thing to hear, but there are documented cases where uh, Russian soldiers killed Georgian men and women, raped them, uh, persecuted, and then played football with their heads. Uh, that's what's your question? Sorry, qu <laughs> I have to yeah, limit because I know, yeah, I that's why them. I said I had the big one. So the question is, um, how do you think, how should the West, uh, the Western governments, shift their policies in order to, you know, deter Russia, because we saw that the appeasement policy for the last 30 years has not worked, because Russia, as soon mm -hmm. as it sees that you have a weakness, okay. it, you, you know, comes back at you, so... What Thank you so do? much. Thank I, you. I got your points, and I will be actually, if possible, in the bullet points, like one, two, three. So there are questions about what to take away to the governments, and the second one, what, if not to appease, what to do? You know, if I paraphrase correctly. Well, because my, my professional interest is academic rights and freedoms. And my proposal is to, to define the, the policy of the different countries about their collaboration with the Belarus and, and Russian academics and students in exile. Because currently, substantial amount of the numerous of the countries who are trying to ban all their collaborations. And this is the fantastic a contribution to the to the Putin's policy to isolate the country, because those who are left the country, those who have tried to escape the indoctrination and propaganda of Russia, they are living for uh, for Europe, and here they are banned as a Russian or Belarus citizen. And there's my my uh, my request, if I if I can, of course, that is just to separate the uh, institutional collaboration and personal. Thank you, Tatiana. So. Um, I would like 
to, to like shortly say that it's really important uh, to spread among civil society, not only to tell about it to the government, what is happening also in Belarus, because as uh, far as the island, yes, and um, I left Belarus almost two years ago, actually, because of uh, uh, presidential elections, that people inside the countries do not know a lot what is happening in Belarus. Yes, and I think this is one of the most important points, so that also society make uh, government uh, make such decisions. Um, for Belarus, yes, uh, for actions toward Belarus, yes, to listen to Belarusian authorities, but keep in mind these requirements uh, that uh, they already expressed. Yes, stop repressions, release political prisoners. Also, Natalia said about uh, get, get rid of Russian yeah. uh, troops in, in uh, Belarus and start to talk to people. This is what also that should be uh, translated by uh, governments of your countries. Yes, and... Um, Something else. <laughs> about not appeasing, so what to do? The policy of not appeasing, but what to do? Um, I also, yeah, I'm sorry, I also wanted to add that uh, we consider it really important that uh, European countries, USA, make everything possible to support Ukraine. So th this is also vitally important for us. We understand it. Thank you. Thank you, Natalia. So, first, Marek, huge kudos to Poland already. They're doing incredible things for Ukraine. So keep doing what you're doing. <laughs> you're doing it well. Thank you. Um, as for the West, um, this is something that you know we are trying to appeal to: is that uh, arm Ukraine. The West collectively is attempting, well, well, it's half attempting to win this with our hands. And if, unless they can imagine uh, us in a fist fight winning this thing we need weapons to be able to do that and uh, that's one thing the other one is to stop inventing red lines because they have a tendency of saying you know if russia does this our response will be very strong then russia does exactly that and then there's a new red line you know now it's the chemical attack well then it will be a nuclear bomb you know things like that so there's no point in invent inventing these lines because you are the only ones, as the West, right? You're the only ones sticking to them. They don't care about your red lines. To them, it's a weakness. And you can fight this regime, uh, you can fight Russia the way it is right now, only with strength. You know, they have to be defeated. They have to be defeated completely. They need to pay for what they have done. And then, you know, in a couple of dozen years, we can try <laughs> talking to them about their reintegration into the civilized world. And let's stay strong together. And thank you very much for all of the panelists and all of us. Slava Ukraini! <laughs>